We are live. Yet another Ask Us Anything session. Today we are going to talk about the subject. The main subject for your questions is everything about serverless in Kubernetes. And as always, doesn't have to be limited by that uh, subject. So you can ask anything actually, right? Uh, but we have experts, uh, two of them, especially related to K-native in Kubernetes, and that's Salaboy, Mauricio, and Whitney. With Whitney, I, ha I had a two hours of torture with Whitney. Whitney uh, we just finished, and now she's going to receive one hour of torture. Uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm a better host. I'm going to torture only for one hour. So okay. uh, let me be clear Victor on that one. Victor and I made the, the slight board together over the last couple of hours talking about cross-playing. Was, yes, we, we should yeah. we should have some kind of giveaway competi competition, kind of like if anybody figures it out, get something. <laughs> 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 so uh, start typing your questions for me, for Mauricio, for Whitney, anything related with uh, K-Native, anything related with serverless, anything related with anything. If we have no idea, the answer is going to be, I have no idea. And while waiting for that, uh, Mauricio, Whitney, in any order you want, you want to introduce yourselves? Whitney, please. Uh, my name is Whitney. I'm a, oh, I'm a little baby gangster. Wow. I just started in tech in 2019, but I learn out loud and I have a lot of fun. And I am in my house. I have a show called Enlightening, where I have on guests like Victor, who teach me something and I draw out on the board as I'm learning. And here I am. Um, being, I think this is maybe the first time anyone's called me an expert, so I'm going to try to live up to that. Yeah. So yeah, and my name is Mauricio. I'm working for the K Native, like with the K Native project, uh, and K Native is a large project, and I'm specifically working on K Native functions. For the last year, I've been working on that project, and it's pretty interesting. It's really nice to see how people is developing kind of like serverless solutions and applications on top of Kubernetes. And it's a, like a big ecosystem. So there are like different ways of doing that, depending on what you are looking for. I am really passionate about Kubernetes and I'm, you know, I'm known Victor for a long time. So I'm super happy to be here. Okay, so we have a couple of people saying hello. Hello, hello to everybody saying hello. Napoleon and Whitney. Karen, Kundan, if I'm butchering your names, tell me Ganesh. Hello, hello, hello. So, uh, shall we go for the first one? Who dares CICD for serverless using Techno pipelines? Is that a thing? Is that something people should be using? How should they be using it? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. I think that I can start with the answer, like if you if you allow me. Um, yeah, go ahead. Mo mostly because uh, that's kind of like what we are doing in Knative, right? Like Knative and Tecton are very uh, closely related projects. They started together, like Tecton was part of Knative in the beginning, and then it was a split on its own thing because it's more about pipelines. And for example, deploying and building functions using Tecton pipelines, it is a thing. It is a thing that we are developing there, like in the Knative functions project. If you're interested in that, you should be looking for something that it's called on cluster builds, right? Like, and with that, what we do is we allow to create like a function locally and then uh, trigger a Tecton pipeline to fetch the code uh, for that uh, function and then just build it inside the cluster and then do the deployment from within the cluster itself. So yes, it is a thing. I think that there will be a lot of uh, more more of that like coming uh, in the, you know, in, in the in the future. Oh, yeah. Have you seen that? Uh, Victor before, yes, I, I'm assuming, yes. Oh, sorry, oh, I was muted, sorry. Uh, Joao, can we measure, how can we measure when it's worth moving serverless from a cloud to Kubernetes? That's a tricky one, man. That's a very what difficult would be, question. What would be the reason for somebody to move? I mean, I guess, let's start by defining before answering this question, let's start by defining what is serverless, because I think that my definition of serverless might be actually very different from other people's definition of serverless. So I don't know, Whitney or, or Mauricio, who wants to give it a try? What, what is serverless? 
when I talk about serverless in my in my Knative talk, I like I I actually prefer to just leave the word serverless out of it because I think it's a little bit of a misnomer, and instead say scale to zero. So basically, when um, a, a pod is running, if it's not being used, if that application isn't being called, then that will scale to zero. The pod will disappear, so there'll be no resources on the cluster related to that app, that running application until that application actually gets some traffic. I like that. I like that because you know, I might be wrong, but I have a feeling that in many, many people's heads, uh, serverless is defined by uh, early versions of serverless, which were mostly functions as a service. So very often, again, I might be wrong. Very often people, when they say serverless, they mean Lambda. Mm -hmm. uh, and the definition you, Whitney, just gave to me sounds much better because serverless can be a function, can be a normal stateless application, can be theoretically even a stateful application, right? We, I've seen uh, serverless databases in Azure, right? I, I forgot the name now, but uh, mm -hmm. so scales to zero. I, the only thing I would add maybe Whitney is, uh, and I do not really manage the infrastructure of that, yeah. uh, of that something, right? Kind of no infrastructure, no servers to be managed. There are servers. It's not serverless. Yeah. Uh, don't manage infrastructure scales to accommodate the workloads. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there, do, there does need to be some sort of something on the cluster watching to know when traffic comes in to be able to, to create the pod. So it's not, there's not zero servers and there's not zero resources, but you can use much less resources because that one resource can be watching several serverless serverless applications, as opposed to having to have a minimum number of pods running for every single application that you want to have scale to zero capabilities. So going back to Joao's question, anybody there? Yeah. I see you, Mauricio, saying doing this. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I want to. I I really wanted to go back to the question itself because it's it's all about like when to do serverless on top of Kubernetes, right? And I think that that's very related to the presentation that you did in Barcelona, Victor, which was all about that, like all the abstractions and realizing that Kubernetes is just a basic set of building blocks. And I would say that whenever you start thinking about serverless on top of Kubernetes, that basically means that you are already heavily investing in Kubernetes, right? Like if you are like using lambdas, there is no reason, like there is no good reason to say, okay, I will just switch everything to Kubernetes and then I will start running serverless workloads on Kubernetes. You need to, it kind of like needs to be the other way around. You are already fully invested in Kubernetes and you realize that the serverless approach or like the programming model or the way of dealing with things that serverless like promotes is something that you want to run on top of Kubernetes. And at that point, there are like several projects that will allow you to do something similar. But at the end of the day, you will need to, you know, glue a bunch of tools together to achieve something similar to what like Lambda is, is providing. And sometimes you don't need exactly what Lambda is providing. You need something a little bit different. And that's where the Kubernetes option, it's worth the time because you can actually customize how that experience will be, how complex it will be, how much management do you want to have all, of all these, all these pieces and, you know, and, and how all the opinions do you want to add on top of that? And potentially good. It also depends how you define to Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I could right now be using Azure Container Apps. Am I running my serverless in Kubernetes? Yes. Do I ever see that Kubernetes? Nope. No. No. Like, I will never see it. <laughs> I'm still running it in Kubernetes, right? Okay. So uh, serverless databases. Cloud providers start offering this. Is there anything Kubernetes open source that I did not find yet? Oh, I'm going to uh, extend this uh, with the second question, especially for Mauricio. When are you guys going to allow mounting volumes? That's already there, as far as I understand. That's something that we are working uh, that we were working on. That uh, I think that's already included. We can actually attach volumes, and you can just connect to them. I think that that's kind of like a Knative misconception that that was something that we were not supporting for a long time and now it's supported. I can expand on that, uh, but I will just need to review the current state. I just don't want to start saying that we fully support mounting any kind of volume. 
But yeah, going back to serverless databases, what do you think about it? Does that make sense? The access to the data, I think that that can be managed in a way that, you know, like it's actually, you, you, you want to interact with the database and you always need to have that bridge to connect to something just to go and fetch the data that's probably stored in a, in a disk, right? Like in a volume in this case. Mm -hmm. I think that that might be a good idea uh, to start having some of that. I haven't heard about anything open source that, you know, it's like gaining a lot of momentum. What about you, Victor or Whitney? Have you heard about any, anything like that? <coughs> I mean, I'm, you know, to be honest, I'm questioning even the use case for that, mm -hmm. at least in this point of time, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, starting a database, I mean, the container is going to start in no time instantly. Mm -hmm. Uh, a bit of time until the queue is recognized and let's say k-native or anything we use starts it but then it takes time until actually data is really mounted and processed it's not going to be fast mm -hmm. yeah and Usually how often do people caches, right? how, mm -hmm. how often people you so the real question is uh, how many people have a use case where database is used but very infrequently Mm -hmm. to justify going to zero and right. what resource are you even really saving because the data has to live somewhere it has to be stored somewhere so like you're saving the bridge of being able to access that data but you're not saving the disk space of the data itself are you no exactly yeah mm -hmm. we'll get there i'm pretty sure somebody's going to come up with <laughs> the solution so how many people will use it? I, I'm really liking things that are working kind of like a SaaS offerings right now, right? Like that's something that I really like. And uh, just tying back to the previous stream about Crossplane, right? I, I do think that like consuming databases that are just services that offer different kind of like a performance and different like specifications for, for storing different kind of data or for aggregating data is something that I'm I'm seeing more and more, and the more I use Kubernetes, the more I like you realize that databases are not going to run inside Kubernetes, and you will need to have this kind of bridge to an external service that it's actually persisting data, aggregating data, and you know, and, and, and crunching all that amount of data that usually you will just not do inside inside the cluster. Oh. Can, will someone tell me what the difference is between serverless yeah, versus serverless cloud native? Yeah, I mean, uh, because K-native is K-cloud native, right? Yeah. And it's serverless in Kubernetes. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit misleading, to be honest, but th there must be a difference between cloud native and Kubernetes, but yeah, I think let's, Kubernetes let's is a about, subset of cloud native, right? Let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. And I think that maybe the question is going in the direction of if you are running Kubernetes, that basically means that you have a bunch of servers running, right? Like, so it's, it's kind of like you need to manage the, the Kubernetes servers on its own, right? Like if you're running on a cloud provider, you need a bunch of master nodes to be running mm. with stuff like uh, in Google cloud, like you can add, actually not and just uh, auto scale the master like the master nodes and all that stuff so they are like kind of serverless in a way that they are like managed and you're not managing them and then yeah like when you run like software on top of that you need to make sure that the software that you're running can again like we mentioned like scale down to zero and make sure that it's not like adding you a lot of burden in order to maintain where that software runs and that's kind of like what we are aiming with Kinetic. Okay, I like that. What's next? What is the best tool for even driven auto scaling Kubernetes? Oh, I know that one. We know that one. Yes, go for it. Keda. Yes. I dare anybody to contradict me. <laughs> no, no, that sounds pretty much right. Okay. Oh, easy. This yeah. was the fastest answer ever. Yeah. Okay, who's gonna take open fast thoughts? Mauricio. Uh, I, yeah. So to be honest, I'm not an expert on open fast at all, right? Like uh, it's another tool that will allow you to do like functions as a service. Mm -hmm. And I think that you should give that a try if you're interested in, in that space, right? Like you have K-native, you have open fast. 
for like event driven auto scaling, you have Keda. There are a bunch of things in the CNCF landscape that will allow you to do different flavors. And I think that at the end of the day, it really depends on kind of like what you're planning to build. I do not have a strong opinions about OpenFast. I'm not an expert. I haven't used it that much. So I think that I, yeah, I can just not say much about that. And I'm really biased because of, I'm working on Knative as well. Knative on GCP autopilot clusters. At the moment, it's not working. Do you know if there is any hope for it? That's a very uh, good question. I'm surprised. I did not know that it doesn't work there. Uh, mm. But when I think about it, so here's a question for uh, maybe for you, Mauricio. Uh, so Knative, that's great, right? Uh, but if I'm going to spin up a VM first every time I need a new instance of Knative, does it become a bit too slow then? Every time that you need an instance because of Because autopilot will essentially, mm -hmm. you know, oh, you kind of like give you a cluster for exactly what you need. Knative is running controller over there. Uh, requests start coming. It, it should scale from something to something else higher. As a result, autopilot will first create a node, attach it to the cluster, and then there would be in, in, in enough capacity to run um, a new pod of your app, right? Mm -hmm. And at that point, it will take time to create that node, right? Exactly. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so I, I have, I have cool. a feeling in my head that if you're using Knative in Kubernetes cluster yourself, that you might want to actually not go with exact, kind of like my cluster is having exactly what it needs and it will scale up whenever I need something else but yeah. actually have a bit of extra capacity. So Sorry, you, I stopped you. Oh, you. no, if it is, so I'm learning, I'm learning a lot from you all. So GCP autopilot cluster, it sounds like it, it is actually literally serverless if you're saying that a new machine gets spun up as needed, yes. as opposed to what we are calling serverless, which is containers or, or pods. Exactly, so it will, yeah. and it's really cool because it actually scales your cluster it does something similar to, uh, oh, my uh, carpenter, right? It will create a node that is exactly the size of the workload that is uh -huh. pending, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not even scaling, oh, I have five big nodes, I will get a sixth big node. No, that node will be exactly the size of mm -hmm. the pending workload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in my head, yeah. that, that, that introduces additional complications for yeah. Self-managed Kubernetes cluster running Knative or something similar. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like you can't even pre-cache your images at all for in which would slow everything down too. As well. Exactly. Yeah. And I would say that that's that's correct, right? Like when you are like starting stuff on demand, you need to make sure that you have enough caches and enough things preloaded so those things can actually start fast. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that might be one of the main reasons why Google, who runs like the same interfaces of Knative in Google Cloud Run, they are just actually not using the Kubernetes implementation. I'm guessing that it's related to that because they want actually like a very elastic server that can scale and can scale fast. So maybe Kubernetes is not ready just to do that yet. On Knative, on GCP autopilot clusters, I will check that. Uh, I would say that there should be hope because, yeah, we are pretty much interested that we can just get it working there. So keep an eye uh, on that. Check if there is no issue for that. And if there is no issue, I would recommend you to create an issue because, you know, that's a very good way of contributing back. What is CRD in Kubernetes? Oh, Whitney needs to answer because we spoke about CRDs for <laughs> at least two hours now. <laughs> it's I'm kidding. You don't have, yeah, go okay. <laughs> A custom resource definition, if you see in, in our drawing back here, um, it's it's when you extend the functionality of Kubernetes based on what you want. So Kubernetes has a lot of uh, components naturally on the control plane, but there are literally thousands of additional components you can add that will add um, controllers to your cluster that can can basically create new resources to do brand new things. And that can be things like um, SaaS offerings or databases or a cross plane is what we talked about today, or it can help in a CICD way, it can help with data, really like whatever you want to use your Kubernetes cluster to do, you can supercharge your cluster in those particular ways, bring in tools with your CRDs, your custom resources, custom resource definitions. 
how is that? <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So su it. summarizing, it's just extending Kubernetes, right? Like just the mm -hmm. mechanism to extend what Kubernetes can do. And just only that's kind of like the CRD is just the definition part of it. Then you need a component that basically will look into these new things. So mm -hmm. it knows what to do with these new things that, that you're extending Kubernetes, Kubernetes with. Uh, Manikanta, <laughs> I checked your Dapper video, but is it possible to use Dapper for MongoDB and Kafka using SSL certificate instead of username and password? <coughs> uh, I, I think so, but I need to double check really about SSL. I don't know if you, Maurice, you know already. Um, no. No, I yeah. have no idea. It sounds like yes. Oh, is this a uh, subject of our talk in KubeCon? It's Mauricio? part of it. <laughs> it yeah, is part yeah. of it. Yeah, it is. It is. I think that like that's something that you mentioned before, right? Like uh, we submitted something for KubeCon that involves Knative, both like serving, like scaling things up and down, and also like all the traffic management, plus all the event, uh, all the event driven application side of things as well building these kind of like functions that create events and consume events to interact between each other and uh, how that will work in a scenario where you actually don't have any cluster and you want to create a cluster plus a bunch of other things like message brokers and then just put Knative and something that runs Knative inside of that those clusters so i see a lot of that like in in the community every time that i present about uh, Knative, I see a lot of people building platforms with Knative and also with Crossplane. And that's why I think that we decided just to meet something to KubeCon because we see a lot of people doing that. And to answer that question, yes, yes, and yes, uh, you will be seeing a lot of that in the, you know, in the next six months. What are your thoughts about using Knative tracing and telemetry capabilities versus code level instrumentation? Yes, this must be Mauricio. Yeah. Let's 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 try to break the question down, right? Like, what is like, what are your thoughts about using Knative tracing and telemetry capabilities, right? Like, that's something that you can enable uh, when you install Knative, right? Like, you can actually add like tracing capabilities and open telemetry, so you can get some insights about what Knative is doing. Uh, and versus code level instrumentation, I think that you can also add like tracing and telemetry to like your Knative services as well, like the implementation of those services. And then by that, like you're going to be able to see what's happening in Knative itself, how things are being scaled up and down, how messages are being created. And then inside your logic of the application that you are running with Knative, you will be able to see what's going on in there as well. I'm not entirely sure that I'm answering the question. I think that you need tracing and telemetry all over the place. It seems because like you need both. It doesn't seem like an either or thing. And I heard a great analogy with observability where like deploying your application is like sending a rover to Mars. Like once you do your code level um, implementation, then you send it off into the world and then you're able to collect information from that, but you can't alter how you changed it. But anyway, it doesn't seem like either or question to me. Do you have to choose between those things? Because those are different levels, really. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Knative gives you tracing and telemetry of what Knative. Knative is doing with yes. those pods. Mm -hmm. And code level instrumentation is what is happening inside of the code of your apps, mm -hmm. which is yes. probably equally valid no matter whether it's Knative or a deployment or something else. Yeah. I know that there is like a very hard problem to solve there when you're talking about like more functions or like the real like serverless approach where things go away, right? Mostly because when you are like uh, collecting metrics about some, some stuff, you need to have an endpoint to go and collect metrics to, right? And if these things are going away, there is no endpoint to go and, and fetch stuff. Yeah, and I know that there is some work around that that to, to solve uh, how to push talk, metrics instead of collecting. If I would focus now only on Prometheus, mm -hmm. that would be push gateway, right? Yeah. Push gateway is sitting there and Prometheus is collecting metrics from it. And instead of collecting it from your app, which can disappear before Prometheus pulls, your app would be pushing it to push gateway. And then it would stay there until Prometheus itself pushes it. I'm not sure about tracing though, but please for telemetry in case of Prometheus, that would be the pattern. Yeah, I, I just I just think that the community itself, we need more examples and we need just to show how, how, how that gets done, uh, like more real examples so people can just go and then copy mm -hmm. instead of like trying to uh, reinvent kind of like the solution there. 
Any advantage from Knative in distributed microservices system? We think that you want to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, probably the biggest advantage would just be that if, if you're using Kubernetes as your distributed uh, platform, is that you can deploy much easier with Knative than you would with vanilla Kubernetes. It would be maybe 10 lines of YAML and one component you need to concern yourself with as opposed to uh, four to 10 components and, and 40 to, to 150 lines of YAML. Uh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, that, that, to me, this goes back to that uh, short conversation we had about CRDs, really. Mm -hmm. It's, I see, I see Knative, so no, going back actually, I see Vanilla Kubernetes is building blocks which are really not very useless, useful to many unless you are a Lego type of person who likes <laughs> uh, constructing things. And Knative might be closest to the concept of an application that we have in Kubernetes right now. Mm -hmm. There is no, no such thing as application in Vanilla Kubernetes. Knative uh, is, is one of the solutions to say, hey, this is an application, not... Yeah. Lego it's, it's, pieces. Yeah, I, I usually I, I think that that like comparison between Lego and building blocks is pretty pretty spot on. Right? Like you can think about like services deployment, you know, replica sets and all these things are like basic Lego blocks. Mm -hmm. When when I talk about Knative, I really like to compare them with the Lego kits, right? Like when you buy a kit of Lego to build a house, you will get like a piece that it's like a very perfect window, right? And sometimes you need a window in order to build a house, right? So in that case, you are getting kind of like up into the abstraction level to say, okay, now you have more concrete things to do very specific things. And mm -hmm. Knative give you those things for doing more advanced things with, you know, with traffic management as well. Like it's not only a scaling down to zero, but it also allows you to do traffic splitting and do implement like different uh, release strategies. And, and I think that all those things you will need when you're using Kubernetes, but the plain vanilla building blocks uh, that are provided by Kubernetes itself they are just not providing all those features. So you need kind of like another framework on top just to start getting more of those things uh, that you will need anyways. Is there something like Flagger for Knative? Okay, let me rephrase the, the question first. Can Flagger work with Knative? I no, haven't tried it, but based on the syntax, I don't see why not. I think that it, it's not working. That's something that I'm really pushing for to see if we can include because it does make a lot of sense to make these projects that are now all part of the CNCF to work together and Flagger and Knative, they should work together. The same as like Argo rollouts, right? Like Argo rollouts are not, it's not actually working with Knative right now because they use kind of like they monitor different kind of resources, but there is nothing stopping us from a community point of view just to integrate these solutions together. So they, they can actually work. So if you're interested in that, Feel free to reach out uh, because we are like trying to create a group to to work on that stuff. Nice. I was wrong because I was checking the docs, and yeah, I mean, just to refresh my memory, uh, Flagger has target reference, which can be theoretically any Kubernetes resource. But I'm guessing that something in the background is still required. Yeah. And I think that's that's the same thing as I mentioned before. As a community, we just try to build more examples around like how to use these different tools. Because if not, at the end of the day, you will see that a lot of companies that want to use all these things, they are just spending time on doing that. And that should be kind of like part of uh, the value of we provide like in the like in the CNCF ecosystem, right? Like projects working together, <clears throat> simplifying stuff for people so they don't actually need to build all that glue. Okay, serverless and Kubernetes with spot nodes. What's a spot node? It's a cheap node with uh, without or very low SLA. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a leftover. So if if you think about physical servers, server has I don't know like hundred CPUs and. 90 CPUs are already used by people running VMs, and then there is that one, one CPU left, right? Uh -huh. I'm simplifying it greatly, and then it gets at a much cheaper price. Right? You, you can get easily half of the price for the same capacity when mm -hmm. it's a uh, spot uh, node. But it's yeah, not spot. guaranteed that it will run over 
years, right? Kind of like it can be shut down um, at, at any given moment. Which, now when I think about it, ignoring the potential performance issues, that sounds like a good thing for serverless because mm -hmm. Kinetic pods are also not supposed to be running forever. Yeah, but but you just said ignoring the potential performance issues, right? Like like you would need to pre-cache your, your application image to really take advantage of, of at least the, the pod spinning up quickly. But, Is that difficult you know, with spot nodes? I would like your opinion about actually on that, right? Very often, so if it would be Lambda, that uh, every request is a new replica, uh, speed is extremely important, right? Mm -hmm. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, in Knative, that's not necessarily true. The speed, when it scales to zero, the first, the speed to create the first replica is important. Mm -hmm. But the speed to create the second replica is not that critical because the first replica is going to still handle that uh, that additional traffic, right? So it's not that you still ha you have an instance because a pod, a replica handles, I don't know, you say 100, I think 100 by default, right? Correct me, Mauricio. Yeah. Uh, request and then you have 110. That will still work, right? Yeah. Until the second. Yeah, yeah, up. that's so, that's the thing with with K Native, like you can actually configure how many requests like a single replica can handle, and that gives you a lot of flexibility if you actually know what the traffic of your application will be in advance, right? Mm -hmm. You can say even like in, in K Native, you have like the possibility of saying, do not scale it to zero, right? Like you can have at least like three replicas running all the time, and you have kind of like that flexibility to go all the way down to zero or at, or have like a fixed amount of replicas running in order to ha handle those kind of like spikes in traffic. But yeah, like just to go back to, to your point, uh, Victor, is like you can configure Knative to deal with multiple requests at the same time without like creating new replicas for every request. It does seem worth pointing out that Knative can scale based on concurrency as opposed to vanilla Kubernetes that scales on memory and CPU. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Here's my, I have a question now. Wait, before people. Uh, any conversations about uh, including Keda into, or is it kind of like too much of the same of what Knative does? Would there be any advantage of that? I think that we have already. We have like a Keda integration in Knative. There is uh, there is a, like a like a project in Sandbox where you are like we are using Keda just to scale up some services, right? I think that it does make sense. Like it's it's like complementary tools that you can use together to do different things, right? Like you can be looking into Kafka messages and then triggering like the Knative scaling based on that, which makes a lot of sense. And Knative by default will look into requests, which is not like Kafka messages. So for some architectures, more, mostly like on the event-driven side, like mixing Keda and Knative will actually, it, it actually makes sense. I would recommend you to check that like sandbox project uh, into GitHub, uh, in Knative sandbox uh, GitHub repository because yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Okay. What would be the closest thing to GitLab CI CD? I could deploy in Kubernetes for CD. I would go with Argo CD. Cool. What would be the simplest CI part? Uh, I, before you answer, I see that you're already preparing to answer. I don't necessarily like the division. I like to speak about, uh, you know, GitOps or whatever you want to call it and pipelines, because I think that very often you will use pipelines after what people call CD as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that same tool might actually end up with Argo CD and then go back to pipelines to do additional testing in production, whatever. But okay, so I'm, I'm digressing now. Uh, who wants to take it? Mauricio. Do you want me to take that one? Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Like, so you have like Argo CD for, for the CD part, right? Like, and Victor, what you're saying is that basically that's the GitOps side of things, right? Uh, yeah, so I, yeah. I like to split it like kind of, you have synchronization between Git and your cluster. That's what Argo CD yes. does. Mm -hmm. And I like to define it as you have, and that's continuous, right? Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. have one shot operations. These are the, the sti things that I need to execute before or after or during yeah. Argo City is doing stuff and we call it pipelines, right? Yes. I would say that, that like that's why GitHub Actions is so popular, right? Like because you can do all the building of your artifacts there in the cloud without managing servers again. 
uh, mm -hmm. and all these kind of like SaaS offerings for for CI, like just for running pipelines, are pretty good. We mentioned Tekton before. That's much more for building platforms. Again, it's just a set of building blocks. I wouldn't say that that's the simplest part for for solving CI, but it's one of uh, one of the Kubernetes native alternatives that you should take a look at, depending on kind of what your use case is. Usually, I tend to think that pipelines should be taken care of by someone else, like a managed service that simplifies my life. As a developer, I don't want to deal with many pipelines, to be honest. Yeah, yeah Mauricio, if you, if, you, if you use the word Tekton together with simplest, you would be kicked out of the stream. I know. <laughs> I, I, that's why I made the clarification. It's not the simplest thing. <laughs> it's complicated. If you are building platforms, that's the thing for you. But it's, yeah, it's not simple. What would be the go-to Kubernetes like K3S, Minikube for single node cluster? Uh, I know not the cluster for dev environment. Um, so if it's a local one, I have a very strong opinion on that one. Uh, Rancher desktop. Is it? Rancher is it the yeah, best? I kind of. I I kicked out all all the others from my laptop. Kind of like I don't have Docker anymore. So K3S is K3D, which runs K3S, is is out of the game. Minikube. Kind, kind is out as well. Because of Docker. Yeah, yeah. A kind of Rancher desktop is killing it in my book, except in Linux. I'm not sure whether it works there. Uh, but on Mac, Windows is killing it. I will need to give it a try because my Docker installation is giving me nightmares. Right, like it keeps like <laughs> yeah, it keeps breaking all the time, <laughs> updating, and it's just nuts. So Rancher desktop is the answer then. Yeah. What is, oh, I, I have no answer to this one, man, uh, or women, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what is cloud native? Just using containers or using proprietary cloud tooling? I mean, I don't have answer, but it's not just containers that, that I, can, I, can, I can sign. That was exactly my question before, because we had a question that was like, like, what is cloud native versus, like, should you use serverless on cloud native using versus using serverless on <clears> Kubernetes? <throat> And so I was like, I don't, I honestly don't know what the difference is. I mean, I know Kubernetes is a kind of cloud native, but I don't really understand what other ones are, except maybe like Amazon ECS instead of Amazon EKS. But it, very I, to me, it reminds me of DevOps kind of like, I never understood the real definition of what it is beyond kind of like people saying whatever is in CNCF is cloud native, kind of, which is silly by itself, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would say that like cloud native is just a way of doing things, right? Like the same as DevOps, right? Like it's just more like a cultural things on, on how do you design applications, and like thinking about that, like about like the servers are not going to be managed by you, and things can go down, things can break, but your application should be resilient. So it's a bunch of patterns, mostly derived from like the you know like the twelve factor apps that were kind of like defined. Like if you go to twelve factors.net, I think. You can see kind of like all the principles that kind of help to define what the term cloud native is. So it's like a cultural thing on how do you design applications, thinking about that these applications will run on the cloud, that they can scale, that they need to be resilient. So definitely not, it's not only about using containers or using kind of like a very specific uh, cloud tool. It's just more about like how do you design and the principles that you use to architect these applications. I usually tend to push the answer towards that direction. So in that case, it doesn't even necessarily have to be on the cloud, is what you're saying. It could be using those those principles, those twelve factor principles, and running it on prem. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And that's kind of like why you can run like Kubernetes on prem as well, right? Like because Kubernetes was kind of like built using all these cloud native like like architectural patterns, and I think that that's kind of like pretty powerful. It doesn't really need to be running on the cloud. When you think about like what is cloud, it's kind of like what's the definition of cloud nowadays? Mm -hmm. It's just a, a bunch of clusters and computers that are running somewhere mm -hmm. that you actually don't need to know where they are running, but then you can just access and use them. Consider a Mongo cluster consisting of three nodes. Does using these nodes as pods in Kubernetes cluster help? You can use auto scaling from transparent maintenance when some pod fails. Opinions, thoughts. I would uh, never run a database inside Kubernetes <laughs> unless you want to manage it and unless you have the people that knows how to manage databases inside Kubernetes. It doesn't matter if it's like Mongo or like more like PostgreSQL. 
if you don't have like people that actually understand how that those monsters are being are scared. there database offerings like cockroach db or like cassandra that are meant to be run in kubernetes that are the way they replicate and distribute so that they're fault tolerant yeah yeah you know without so if i start with theory I don't see a reason why database shouldn't be in Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, I honestly don't. Uh, I can also argue that I, don't, that I don't necessarily think that everybody should just move their databases from somewhere else to Kubernetes. But if we start from scratch, and if you take a database that is designed or heavily rewritten to run Kubernetes, meaning that I'm going to manage the databases not as a stateful set, but there will be an operator over there that will allow me actually to do things that are allowed to do and will take care of everything. In theory, I'm not against it. Now, yeah. whether that's Mongo, I'm not sure. But that's the thing. You have a point there. Like the database needs to be heavily designed for Kubernetes. Yeah. If it's not, then you're like running into a lot of troubles because there will be a mismatch about like how the databases scale up or scale down or whatever. Uh, compare with how do you scale things up in Kubernetes. And somebody will need to understand those mismatches and then just manage all that stuff. That's a nightmare that as a developer, I don't want to do, I don't want to know. I want the URL, I want to connect to my database. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, no, no, of course, I mean, I always want SAS to begin with, kind of like make it somebody else's problem. <laughs> but if somebody else is, is, is a team in your company, to, to me kind of like a good, first kind of like filter is whether actually that hypothetical database has its own custom resource definition. And it's not just a Helm chart that puts Mongo into a stateful set, because then I do stuff that I shouldn't be doing. But if you say kind of like this is, I don't know, like uh, Victor database resource, somebody really designed maybe. Anyways, use a service, use a SAS. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to trigger K80 process using QBMQ? Do you know QBMQ? I have no, no I'm not familiar with details about it. Mm -hmm. Should I be no, looking at QBMQ? Then? But let's say that uh, the same question could be theoretically uh, using Kafka. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing. So let me check QBMQ. I definitely need to check QBMQ because it seems like super interesting. So can you trigger a k-native process using kubemq? Uh, so in k-native, so we remember that in k-native, we have like two big modules. One is serving, which is the scaling down and the traffic management and all that stuff. And then we have k-native eventing, which is all about like events, right? And what we have in k-native eventing is like the concept of event source. And in this case, kubemq can be one of these event sources. The idea here is that if you have like messages in kubemq, uh, we will have kind of like this source that it's kind of like a bridge bringing those messages into, you know, the k-native space. And as soon as like we have that bridge, like picking messages from QMQ and then defining where do we need to route those messages, then, you know, k-native services can be kind of like the subscribers for those messages. So I would say like the, to, to answer your question that yes, but we will need to have that QMQ bridge or QMQ source inside k-native. And I'm not entirely sure that we have it, but uh, looking at like QBMQ website, I would say that that might be something that we should be uh, looking into. So I would just take some notes and, and make sure that we have that discussion in the, in the k -Native community. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Claudio, is k -Native cluster API and crosspoint the next big trend in the industry? Yes. <laughs> yes. I would yes. say yes. <laughs> I mean, okay, so, so look, yeah. I would actually say that uh, I would actually say no for Knative uh, because Knative has been around long enough that it's not the next big thing. Kind mm -hmm. of that's a thing. Yeah. That's a thing, not the next yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it's but proven. It... Kind of like uh, huge companies are using it. Uh, we have Google using it for its services. Uh, I think that other companies, without naming, is using it as well. So it's mm -hmm. it's here. Yeah. I would say that I would say that Kennedy might have kind of like a second like hype now that it's in the CNCF. We are seeing kind of like a lot of momentum, mm -hmm. and I think that people that like people that were skeptical about Knative now that it's in the CNCF, they might be able to revisit that. Uh, 
-hmm. I, would, I would tend to argue about like cluster API in that sentence. I would say that that's also important. That's coming strong. Uh, but crossplane, yes, I'm a big fan. So that's that's already a hype, I would say. That's already kind of like, you know, trending. I heard that Knative requires Kubernetes 121. The last time I checked at work, we were still at using 118. OK, before anybody answer, Eric, you have a problem that has nothing to do with Knative. <laughs> right? Kind of like yeah. 118. I, I don't remember how many. That's not supported anymore. Is it like four yeah. or five minor yeah. releases are actually supported? Something so you like have that. unsupported version of Kubernetes to begin with, right? You should be upgraded, yes. But that's true. Like if you try to install like Knative 1.5, I think that you will need 1.21, I think. That's kind of like that's where we are. Like there is like a matrix of of, of compatibilities there. But again, like if you're upgrading to the latest version of Knative, which is released like every six months, no, sorry, every six weeks, every six weeks, uh, it's going pretty fast. So you should be able to just understand that we are just trying to keep up with the Kubernetes uh, releases as well. And uh, there is a reason for keeping kind of like that alignment. You don't actually need to upgrade Knative all the time if you are kind of like, for example, using 118, because what we are doing is just we are like strength strengthening kind of like the the project itself, like Knative Serving, is pretty mature. And if you have an issue there that you know it's it's bothering you and you still need to support that, get in touch. We we can see if we can just create a patch for like an older release that uh, that you know supports that that fix. But yeah, uh, you can check on like in the website the compatibility matrix because it's yeah, the Kubernetes community is going really really fast. Okay, how to manage secrets in Kubernetes? What are some of the best tools? Wait, I'll, I'll take that, this one very quick. If you prefer GitOps, external secrets are amazing. If you want to manage secrets from external storage store, secret stores, try uh, external secrets operator. And if you do not, I repeat, do not want to say you have secrets altogether, then, uh, well, heck, what is the main name? I, my brain stopped. Um, like Bolt? No, 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 no. You don't want to use both. Uh, secret store CSI driver. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now you can answer if you want. No, I was just want to say like Whitney, maybe that's kind of like a very good topic for one of like the lightning shows, like external secrets. Okay. That's a pretty complicated thing that usually people tend to like mess up completely. And I think like, external secrets is a, it's a great project. So maybe a kind of like good thing. I'm looking forward to see the light board with all the external secret explanation because <laughs> I will be probably learning a lot from that. Is it? Is Dapper considered serverless? What is Dapper, please? So I, 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 let me give it a try. So Dapper is about really uh, communication between apps, containers, applications, whatever, right? Uh -huh. uh, often based on queues right kind of like I'm, i i i don't care about the rest of my system i'm sending either sending messages to some queue uh okay. or i'm subscribing to messages so kind of like we can all be oblivious of each other i don't care whether you need this or you need that i'm going to publish um publish a message or subscribe to a message uh somebody might want to correct me on that one um so I, I don't really see it as serverless necessarily. Kind of, it can work with anything. It it can work with anything, but I think that it might be promoting that, right? Like if you are consuming and publishing messages in the same way that with functions, right? Like you can actually make those things go away if there are no messages to be consumed. So. Yeah. Uh, we are going to use AWS step functions and burning hell. <laughs> You said it, Anton, not us. <laughs> are there better options, ATM? What are the step functions? I haven't used step functions. Yeah. So step functions is just to like define sequences between functions, between lambdas, in this a case pipeline. in AWS. It's okay. kind of like a pipeline, but it's like a logical composition of functions to say, OK, I have a function that you know reads something from an S3 bucket and then just goes and publish you know, like a Kafka message somewhere else, right? And you need kind of like three or four functions in sequence to be executed based on whatever you are putting on S3. 
So with AWS step functions, you just define that sequence. I would say that in the cloud native space, we have something that is called uh, the serverless workflow specification. That's something that is going along the lines uh, and it's much more closer to Kubernetes in the sense that we are just trying to define something that is generic and it's not tied to AWS or any other cloud provider. Uh, I am not, I wouldn't say that I'm a big fan of that specification. I think that we are bringing some of that, some of those things into Knative as well. Not entirely sure if we are going to use the specification to define kind of like these sequences, but uh, in the Knative, you know, community, we are like very, like we are getting closer and closer to flows and, you know, this kind of like step function kind of thing. Uh, we have a working group for that, that's called Knative Flows. We are meeting kind of like every Wednesday. If you're interested in that, you should, you know, are encouraged to, to join these meetings or ping me in Twitter or somewhere else. I will just probably give you all the details there. Thoughts on Solas, Kafka, and Redis for even driven services? I have no thoughts, so it must be one of you or the answer is no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's Kafka. I would say Kafka, it's, it's pretty popular. I'm also like uh, looking pretty closely to Pulsar, right? And again, in Knative eventing, we have kind of like this abstraction. The idea is that you can use Kafka, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, a cloud provider, you know, message broker, and you will be kind of like using it in the same way in your applications without like needing the clients for the specific technology. I would say that Redis might be kind of like another very good alternative. That's kind of like more like a distributed cache where you're going to put information and somebody else will consume for it. The problem there is that usually if you go straight and use Kafka or use Redis, you are like, you know, tying all your services to have the Redis or the Kafka clients. And that's where things become a little bit messy if you, at some point in time, you need to change, you know, that like underlying mechanism to exchange information. Again, I would recommend you to check, you know, Kennedy inventing and the abstraction there, uh, like I think that they are pretty useful. So to be clear, the Knative eventing abstraction will help you not tie yourself into any particular messaging provider. So you can switch later if you decide you made the wrong choice. Yes. And also, uh, uh, as we discussed also like in, in the lightning show is um, you do not need the client, you just use like HTTP requests to send messages. So Knative Eventing takes care of receiving an HTTP request, transforming it into a message, and then just routing that message to wherever it needs to go, which is pretty handy and pretty useful for developers. So they only need to know about how to send HTTP requests. In Argo CD app of apps deployments, how could we manage CA, CD, CD environments like dev, staging, prod? If there are 10 apps, do we need to create 10 repos for each environment? No, no, no. How you organize it, it's really up to you. Uh, each of us might have different uh, preference for organization, but you can tell Argo CD, monitor this whole repository or monitor this directory in this repository or subdirectory. It's really up to you. I'm doing a show on Argo CD next week. Yeah. Exactly. The link up. Yeah. Uh, so, enlightening. <laughs> subscribe uh without cluster out scaler on kubernetes cluster i'm not sure through serverless feature of knative is difficult to realize i may sound a bit naive but correct me if i sound incorrect it, it's about so kind of if you have no cluster out scaler and now this is more a question for mauricio than than a statement from my side uh you can still have choose to have knative or serverless anything the question is not, in my head, not directly related with that, but it's kind of like related with how much you want to pay. Do you want to have a cluster that is over provisioned for a maximum workload? Doesn't matter whether it's serverless or not serverless, or you want to have a cluster that is scaling up and down and you save money in, in the process, right? Yeah. Hopefully ap applicable to, I mean, I can have, 10 nodes cluster because 10 nodes is the maximum workload I have and then easily run K native, right? Yeah. And also you can use like, for example, if you are like in GCP, you can just basically set the auto scaler on the cluster nodes, but also always have kind of like a, a couple of nodes active. So you can actually start creating the instances, right? And as soon as the cluster realized that, you know, you are creating a lot of instances in those nodes, it will just create a new node 
and and by the time that you get like more requests where you need to start using the third node, you know the node will be up. I think that Knative is not like dealing with scaling nodes themselves. Uh, Knative relies on the fact that there will be machines to run workloads, and Knative also relies on Kubernetes and the scheduler, like the Kubernetes scheduler, to decide where those workloads are going to run. So it's again, it's just an abstraction on top of an abstraction. And uh, then you need to basically kind of like understand what the traffic of your applications will look like. It's, you, and then just fine tune Kubernetes, the auto scheduling Kubernetes, and then Knative and how do you deal with the scaling up and things. Another important thing, you can actually configure the maximum number of, of replicas you might want to support, like also limiting you know, the, the, the amount of things that you create. So you don't end up with these situations where you just scale infinitely up and then you ended up like having a huge bill at the end of the month. OK, what else? So we have five minutes left. Knative is having requires a full full fledged service mesh. Is that the case? No, okay. that's not I the case. I see your facial expression. Cool. I thought that I'm going crazy. That, OK, OK, cool. Uh, have a look into Fission where a more functional serverless approach is used. Winnie, do you want to give kind of like a more detailed answer to that one? Uh, sure, I'll do my best. Um, Knative used to rely on Istio, which is a full-fledged server mesh, uh, but now it's, you can use it with Contour or Courier, which are both lightweight. And then it's also now integrated with the API gateway of Kubernetes. It's a standardization for that networking layer. So any networking layer that com complies with API Gateway will work with Knative. Yeah, I think that's kind of like a huge misconception that like early days, you know, we were like Knative was tied to Istio. Then they like the Knative team quickly realized that that was like not the best thing. So they abstracted that away. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned, like we can actually now use very, very lightweight, you know, um, API yeah. Gateway. Another misconception is, I guess, Knative used to be bundled with eventing. The serving and the eventing was, was all in one installation, but now they can be installed separately. So you only need to install what you need as far as that goes, too. How is Knative to compare with PCF in terms of ease of use for developers? What's PCF, please? Cloud Foundry? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question. And again, just like a, the short answer, because we are running out of time, I would say that Knative is, again, is just another set of building blocks to build your own platforms. Cloud Foundry was much more like an entire platform where you just delegate the entire thing to, you know, to, to the platform itself, and then you just send the applications in the shape that Cloud Foundry supported. The mm -hmm. same with Heroku and other kind of like, you know, uh, platforms that promoted that kind of development. With Knative, what you can do is you can build your own platform with your own opinions. Uh, and that usually makes a lot of sense when you are going into Kubernetes and when you uh, have like very specific requirements that, for, for example, like, you know, that, that, are, that are not being covered by Cloud Foundry. If Cloud Foundry works well for you, you should use Cloud Foundry. OK. Uh, let's, close, let's start closing down. Uh, yeah, before before we close down, something that I should have done initially, but I didn't. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, choose to join the channel. It's a coffee a month. You will not go bankrupt. And if you're a company, then sponsor the channel. That's all. That's it. That's my uh, sales pitch. There we go. I would be a great salesman. <laughs> Luckily for other salesmen, I'm not a salesman. Okay. <laughs> so any parting words any I, I we have a bunch of questions this is absolutely amazing uh that so many people are asking questions thank you so much i'm, I'm i yeah. feel kind of sorry bad that we couldn't answer all uh but we'll do it again in two weeks uh and then again after that and again and again and again and again uh, until there are no more questions any parting words uh I Whitney, am, Sala, boy. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely blown away with the amount of questions, right? Like, I'm super um, surprised. We haven't stopped, like, for the last hour, and that's great. Just, uh, like, just to the, the only thing that I wanted to say, if you are interested in Knative, feel free to reach out. There are always, like, issues for newcomers if you want to start contributing. The project is written in Go, but in the function side, we are supporting lots of different languages. So if you are passionate about the language and it's not Go, 
and they want to start contributing to an open source project, mm -hmm. feel free to reach out. I'm at Salawo in Twitter, and you know, I'm always like I have my DM open. So if you want to chat, just drop me a message. And thank you so much for having me here, and thank you for sharing your time and for asking wonderful questions. I'm I'm honored to be a part of this stream. It feels really good. And I guess wait, wait, wait. Yeah. you forgot the most important thing. With Which me. is what? Come and see the subscribe to Enlightening. Am, oh. am I going to do the job for you? <laughs> come to please do come to an Enlightening episode. Next week is Argo CD, so it's very relevant. You'll be learning about Argo alongside of me. And that Argo question, you can please come bring it to our stream next week. And so if you go to tanzu.tv backslash enlightening, but it's spelled like lightning bolt, not like enlightening, like you're enlightened. It's a pun. Uh, but if I have to explain it, <laughs> if I could, I'll try to drop it in the chat. And last time I tried to put in a link, it didn't let me. Go. Yeah, I'll, I'll also put it in the description of this okay, video perfect. later. Awesome. So actually, that's a, that's a, that's a task for both of you. If you want me to add anything, uh, any information about you, Twitter, Lightning, uh, drop me a email. I'll put it to the description. That just shows how unprepared I am for this. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. See you Bye. in two weeks. Thank you very much.